Hi everyone, Joe March here, and today we're talking about the dangers of magic. And why is that? It's because it's something we've talked about over the last five videos, but I don't feel like I've adequately addressed yet, so we're going to talk about it. It seems important enough. It's going to be interesting. So rather than just give you my thoughts on what I think is the most dangerous thing about magic, I'm going to do the thing I normally do where we go into like what they say before we go into what I say, because I think if I just give you my warnings about my style of magic based on my views of what magic are, and my views are wrong, then I'm doing you a disservice by not going over everybody's warnings. So we're going to go into a whole bunch of people's warnings about working with this stuff, and I'm going to give you my thoughts. Now, unlike normal, where I do all of the what they say first, and then all of my stuff, we're going to go bullet by bullet. We're going to say what they say, we're going to do a thing, and then I'm going to talk about my idea. Another one of what they say, my version. What they say, my version. And at the end, we'll get to stuff that maybe I think is dangerous that they don't talk about everywhere else online. So whereas I mostly warn people about traditional spell casting and watching out for what you put in your subconscious mind is the biggest warning, mostly old-timey warnings from back in the day had to do specifically with work with entities. And since I mostly do work with entities, see previous videos if you don't know what I'm talking about, I guess that's a great place to start. The old grimoires were full of all these warnings about these spirits and letting them into your space and whether or not it's okay to have them around and warnings about having your discipline levels up so that you're able to resist whatever comes through. This is very important to most magical practices, especially when you go back far enough. The idea that your discipline and your self-control and your mental stability are very important before you do any spell work, before you work with any entities. You'll see this in a lot of traditional systems as well. People will not be opened right up to working with spells and magic whenever they first get into, say, the Golden Dawn or something like that. You have to work your way to that point by doing meditations, by doing cleansings, by doing all these other things, the goal of which is to fortify the self and the mind. And honestly, I don't really have anything to say differently than that, because I would say that self-discipline and fortifying the mind are important if you're going to get into the practices, even the way that I view them. I don't have as big a dose of fear of the entities themselves as being something that you've invited in the way that the old grimoires do, but I can see how if you think about this from a psychological level, if you're not careful what you invite into the self, then you are transforming the self without any control or any pre-thought, and that's dangerous. If you believe these are separate entities, as they did back in the day, then you could see also why be careful which specific entities you interact with, because it's just like inviting random strangers into your home. Do you just invite anybody you see into your home? Hey, everybody, come into my house. It's fine. Yeah, I'm not even going to have any protection at all. You don't do that for real, so, you know, don't do it here. So if we move away from the old grimoireic traditions that are just entities are tricky, be careful and move towards something a little more modern. You can see in Ceremonial Magic, where they conjure up both demons and angels, they have specific rules to keep the caster safe from whatever force they're calling up. And you'll see this in their use of a circle to protect the caster, and a triangle to entrap the thing they're summoning. And this is to keep a distance between the person summoning and the creature they're summoning, so you are saying, this one area is designated for the thing I'm talking to, and this other area is where I'm protected, and as long as I don't leave my area, it won't leave its area, and we can have a conversation without me having to worry about it interfering with me, as we talked about. It, having its influence deeply drip inside of me, or something of that nature. Again, if you're someone who believes that these are spiritual forces with power and whatever, this can be very important. Even if it's actually psychological, but you believe that they're real, these things can have a very strong impact on your mind as a result. So definitely follow the proper protections that you feel are right for you. I don't use a circle. I don't use a triangle. Some people think that means I'm fucking nuts, but I don't use any of that stuff. I just commune directly with whatever I'm going to commune with. But that's part of my specific style of practice. Most practitioners would say, be more careful than that. Now, moving further away from the demon's bad category of this and into something maybe a little more palatable, we get into imposter spirits or bad energy. 
This is something that does exist in some of the old traditions, but is mostly a more recent way to look at these same things. And it's the idea that if you're not careful about what you're calling upon, if you're calling up an entity, you could get an imposter. It's not really the entity you wanted. It's something that looks like the entity you wanted. Or if you're doing your spell work and you haven't cleared the area of any negativity, you could accidentally take the negative energy from the area and put it into your spell work. In most magical practices, the raising of sacred space is something you do first before any spell work or any work with entities. This can be a variety of things. The most commonly known version, I think, at least here in the West, is making a circle by circling the area that you're going to use and banishing all of the negative energy, all of the existing energy, all of the existing spirits out of that space, basically clearing a room to say this room is going to be used for this specific operation that I'm about to do, and anything not related to the operation has to exit. And basically using your authority through the energies that you are calling to make that so, and the idea being to clear that area Again, so there aren't any other influences. If we go psychological on this, this exercise can be used to help you to clear your own negative thoughts out. Say, like, I got all this other shit running in my mind that has nothing to do with the ritual I'm about to do, and I need to push that away. What better way to do that than instead of just trying to think I don't want to think, which don't work, you go through an active action that gets rid of something that you're visualizing. This process can help us to do things in our mind that we're unable to do without the visualization. That's what I think that is. Other people will really hate that because raising the, ceremony, the sacred space can definitely be part of a religious experience, a belief that God is protecting you or that you're laying down your own power into an area, things like this. And look, I don't have any problem with this practice. I used to do this all the time before doing any of my stuff. Now I don't, but now I feel like I kind of have a handle on what my area is like, like what energies and forces, as you would say, are in and around me at all times because I'm getting to know myself better and I see it more as uh, these layers within the self. So as a result, if the area feels fine, I don't have a feeling or need to exit things out of it, but mostly because most of what I'm doing is trying to learn things I don't already know. So sometimes I want these influences and forces that are going on in my head to project themselves in a way that I can better understand them. I don't want to banish them. But again, if you're new and you're trying to do this stuff, you're trying to get specific results, Probably a good idea to do banishings. Now here's where some people are going to be like, whoa, you're not telling us how to do banishings. You're not giving us steps. How am I supposed to do this stuff? Go look it up. There's like a thousand, a million, I don't know how many magical resources online now. There weren't. Like five years ago when I first came out with my old channel, I was one of the only ones talking about shit like this. Well, I wasn't really one of the only ones, but I mean, there were only a few of us. But now so many people are giving you information that pick your poison, you know, go out there and find some stuff. I don't do this a lot. Like I said, my version of the practice doesn't require it. So if you want to do it, I'm not the right person to learn it from because I obviously don't do it. People say, whoa, then how do you know you're not getting imposter spirits? I don't call on something and just assume it's what it is in the first place. That's not how I work. I, again, my views have to do with me thinking I'm working through the inner layers of the self in combination with the divine and as a result I'm getting whatever I'm getting and I can learn from it but I don't assume whatever I'm talking to has my best interests at heart no matter if it's the right entity or not so this thing doesn't exactly influence me the same way because of the way that I go about it but again if you're gonna go into this and go like I'm gonna go trust Joe on this one and say I'm just talking to pieces of myself so whatever I talk to is fine you should, while practicing, treat it like an external entity because if you treat it like it's part of yourself and you're like, oh, everything must be hunky-dory, it's part of me, there are parts of yourself that would grow within you if you let them that you don't want to have grow within you and you don't want to let them. So you have to discern whether something you're working with is something you want to nourish and foster or something that you need to alter, something that you need to work with to find a healthy use for and then send it out to a task. And maybe that's something I should talk about too. So if you think about it as like 
demons bad and angels good or whatever if that's the way your brain works then that's probably how they'll show up so if you find a demon is it your job to kill the demon if it's a part of yourself it's some dark aspect of yourself what happens if you bury some dark aspect of yourself down deep and just ignore it or think it's gone when it's not you are inviting chaos later it's going to explode out as something stronger later the best thing to do is to face whatever that demon is, get to understand it, and to the point where you can kind of integrate that and understand what part of that is yourself, but don't just accept it ad hoc. Don't just be like, okay, you know what? You're the murder demon, so I guess I'm a murderer now. Like, obviously you don't want to do that. Obviously you don't want to accept into yourself stuff you don't want to be, but you need to figure out what's at the root of this. Why does this thing exist in you? What about this thing is not being fulfilled that's causing it to lash out and become this darker thing and find a way to fulfill that in a healthy way instead? Like maybe you have this thing deep down where you're like, I really get angry and I feel like killing people. But then when you examine it, you don't feel like killing people at all. You just are pissed at people for certain things. And then you figure out like what some of those main things are and you can become an activist for those things and all that rage goes away. But what you're doing is you're taking that demon and you're reforming that demon. You're saying, no, you're not going to do that behavior, but I am going to take this passion that you have that's untapped and point it in a direction that's healthy towards something I think is beneficial, and that's your job now. And then instead of the demon being a demon, it turns into an ally that works on your behalf. Now note, I chose murder to be controversial here. I did not choose it as like an example of something that you should have as a demon. I just mean, you know, any little thing that's gonna come across to you as like negative you should have a goal of transforming it to positive. Not looking at it in a way that makes it positive, because that just allows the bad behavior, but finding a way to get whatever that passion related to it is out in a healthy way. I'd say that's one of the biggest parts of this entire process. It's healing the self. It's healing all those cracks. It's taking those things you think of as demons and try to push away from you, and then converting them into something beneficial to you so that you can be a whole person. I've digressed a lot now from what we were talking about, but you can probably see through the way I'm talking about this why for me circles, triangles, uh, protections, banishings aren't as necessary because of the approach I take to how this stuff works and what you should be using it for. I want to find those dark things and reform them into light things. So if I banish them, I can't do that. But is that something you should be attempting right out the gate? Probably not. So maybe follow some more traditional stuff, some traditional banishing, some traditional protections, at least if you're starting out. Whether you use those protections or you're like me and you kind of cast all that stuff to the wind, there is still something about entities we still need to talk about that's talked about across all the different time periods and different magical practices. And that is deals and pacts. And I agree with this one. I think this is more important than any of the other protections. It's important to be wary of making deals with a spirit, a demon, a fae, an angel, a god, or what have you. If you promise them something, you have to deliver on it or your life is going to turn to fucking chaos. Now, people are going to be like, why? Why is that? Well, let's start out by saying, what if I'm wrong and they are spirits? You make a deal with these things, they're going to fuck you up if you don't follow up on it. The way those deals work is like, I do something for you, you do something for me. So if you do decide, hey, I'm going to make a deal because it's worth it, make sure that what you're offering is worth it. You don't want to get stuck in some like eternal deal where you're eternally stuck doing something for these entities in exchange for like one-off something that you got. Be very, very, very cautious about these deals if you make these deals. But Joe, I hear people saying, I'm with you on the psychological level. How the fuck would it matter if I made a deal with myself? Did you just ask that question? That matters even more. If you promise your subconscious, unconscious self something and then don't do it, what message are you giving yourself about yourself? What is this showing you about you? You don't care enough about yourself to keep your promises to you? This is in itself going to unravel you. If you make a deal, make a pact, make anything agreement-wise, with an entity when you're journeying or when you're evoking or when you're invoking or whatever you have to uphold it or shit's gonna go down i've even seen poltergeist activity around this shit 
One of the things I don't like talking about on here, because I can't really explain it, I have seen people say that poltergeist activity is actually the uh, caster's own mind kind of causing the poltergeist activity, that it's a, a backlash of sorts. And I guess if you think of things from an energy point of view, that makes sense. From a psychological point of view, I've seen the explanation that we can kind of black out and do stuff without knowing it. Uh, so you might go and like rearrange the furniture, but forget it like you've been wiped. So when you come back in, it looks like a poltergeist has moved shit. There's a bunch of different explanations for why this could be the individual, but none of them are good. And I have seen this shit happen when you don't uphold PAC. So I'm not going to go here, there, or anywhere about whether ghosts are real, like, like physically outside of you. But I've seen some poltergeist shit, and I don't fuck with that. So should you never make deals? I didn't say that. You've heard from me myself in the previous videos that long-term commitment to an entity can be beneficial, and merging your own energy with that entity for the sake of your own self-growth can be beneficial. So I've obviously made deals with certain entities. What I'm saying is don't go making tons of deals or not thinking about it or just being like flipping about it. Because even if everything is psychological... You still have to upkeep your deals or your fucking sanity spirals. So now we're done with the entity, demon, angel stuff. We're ready to talk about just magic spells. And this stuff gets a lot more basic at this point. I think the most basic warning you get from everyone is be careful what you wish for. If you think about things like Wishmaster or stories about genies that grant wishes but they fuck you over, this is stuff to think about. Like when you're going, hey, I want to make money. If you assume that magic just causes shit to happen, then you might want to be specific about in which ways you're willing to accept money. You might not want to have a relative die and leave you an inheritance, for example. Now, I personally don't think magic works exactly that way, so I don't have that same fear in that way, but I feel like if I don't bring this up, people who do see it that way and have fucked up shit happen are going to be pissed that I didn't bring up, be careful what you wish for. I have my own version of be careful what you wish for that still matters in the psychological model, which is think about what the fuck you're putting into your own brain. Don't put garbage into your own brain when you're self-hypnotizing during the trance state. You can fuck your mind up. For example, let's say you have a relationship that's going really fucking bad, but it's going bad because it needs to go bad. It's going bad because... Maybe your significant other is a bad person, and you just haven't realized it yet. You need to get realize that this is not the one for you. But you go, fuck that shit, I'm going to do a spell so that I overlook all of their bad things because I think I'm the problem. Well, you just fucking hypnotized yourself, tranced state, said, I'm going to ignore any of this guy's problems, and now you will. You will ignore it, and you will stay with someone who sucks. This is like a really simple explanation but i mean this is the type of stuff i mean when i say be careful what type of shit you're putting in your brain when you do spell casting you can kind of think of it the exact same way as if you were causing things to happen outside of yourself if you just say i want us to stay together well under what circumstances is that still okay right do you just want to stay together no matter the fuck what or are you actually asking to be with someone who cares about you, because those are two different spells. Those are two different concepts. So think real careful about your wording and what you want to have pushed into the subconscious mind, because it's going to change the way you think, and make sure you're not changing the way you think in a way that's negatively impactful to the self. Now let's talk about just being aware of common sense shit. Here's an example from Liebernal, that's a chaos magic related book says Liebernal was written for the serious occult student and therefore contains some powerful rituals. These rituals and exercises should be performed by readers who are in good health. If one suffers from heart disease, epilepsy, or any chronic disease, please do not use the material in this book. The author and the publisher will not accept any responsibility for misuse of this material, nor will they accept any responsibility for anything that has occurred when readers use the exercises discussed here. And this is an excellent point. If you're someone who's in bad physical health and one of the exercises tells you to climb a fucking mountain, you still got to get your physical ability up to that level before you do it or find a different ritual. There's no like, oh, because it's magic, it's just going to work for me and it's worth risking death. That's not how this shit works. Be smart, just like you would with anything else. 
If there's a version of something being told to you that you can't do, like some of these meditations require you to lie still for like hours. And like, if you can't do that because you're physically unable to do that, do a different meditation, dude. It's not the end of the world. It's not like if you can't do it exactly as written, you can't achieve the same states. I feel like this is a newbie problem, that new people will be like, oh, I can't do this, I'm going to force it, and then they hurt themselves. Know your own limits. Don't overdo it. Don't be afraid to do stuff that pushes your boundaries a little, but don't overdo it. And from there, we move on to mental health. You'll see a lot of people explain the idea. They'll say, if you are someone who has mental health issues, don't get into the occult at all. And this is because people that are schizophrenic, for example, can have their schizophrenia worsen when they get into these practices. So some people, if you already have a mental health issue, you get into these practices, it can make them worse. But I've also seen it make them better for other people. So it's a bit iffy whether I agree that it's just cut and dry, don't do it if you have a mental health issue. And also a lot of people who have mental health issues don't know they have mental health issues. Hey, I might have mental health issues and that's why I hear entities and shit. I don't know. But what this really leads me to is the actual warning that I've been trying to give everybody all along, now it's my soapbox time, self-deception. If you are going to do these practices, be wary of self-deception. It's very easy in the trance state to tell yourself something you want to hear and then make your subconscious believe that thing. So be careful not to tell yourself shit to purposely deceive yourself. I think you can get into a lot of trouble with self-help shit and thinking that you're the hero of your own world or thinking that the world revolves around you, or that you can control everything, or this type of shit. Or if you're someone who's coming into this with previous delusions of grandeur, and you bring those in saying, this is going to prove that I'm X, Y, or Z, well, you're bound to just get in the trance state and start acting that way and cause your own subconscious to be even more like that. You can perpetuate an already existing problem if you're not careful. So be disciplined and regimented about it and aware. Now, what do most people say to help this? Grounding. Do grounding meditations, do grounding techniques, do periods of grounding where you're not doing magic. Try to keep in mind you are a human being in the world equivalent to all other human beings. You're not any more special than them. You're not any less special than them. You are just a person. And you need to remind yourself of this when you do these things because the experiences can seem so fantastical that it will tempt you to just disappear into them, which leads to the last warning, escapism. I think a lot of people use these practices as an escape. Could I go into a shamanic journey every day and be wild by my own mind? Yes, I could do this every day. I could do it for hours a day, and I would be happy with that. But would I be living my life while I'm doing that? No, that would be detrimental to my real world life. The goal is not to spend all your time doing this. If you're doing that, you might just be trying to escape from your own life. Now, those are my ideas on what the dangers are of magic. And if you hear all that shit and you're like, I'm still down for it. And also, I just have a passion for it. Well, then I'm not going to be able to stop you from doing it anyway. And you're like me. But if you hear that stuff, you're like, damn, that sounds like more work than it's worth. Then just don't do magic. It's cool. You don't need it in order to evolve. You don't need it to become like spiritually awake. You don't need any of that shit. It's just a tool for people who are pulled toward it. I want to thank everybody for watching this one. Thank everybody for coming. And until next time, safe travels.